Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today we're reading from John 21, starting at verse 15. Jesus reinstates Peter. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Oh, yes, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you tr truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him, a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed, feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself uh, and where you wanted and went. When you're old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said, this indicated the kind of death in which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite Ian to come up and bring God's word to us. Let's just, uh, I'll pray for him, but if you could all pray as well. Um, Father, we just thank you for Ian, Lord, and his willingness to come and share your word with us here at Christ Church. Thank you for the friend he is to Christ Church. And Father, as he brings your word, we pray that our hearts may be open to hear what you want to say to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Might need that. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me again. Um, uh, means I probably didn't do too bad last time, or perhaps you were just so desperate. <laughs> I hear you've got a new vicar coming. That's fantastic. I hear from other people other than yourselves as well that he's a really good one. So look after him. Cherish him. Um, I'm going to speak about how do we handle failure. So it's really interesting your opening gambit around the thing because I think sometimes we really struggle to handle failure well. You know, failure is part of life, isn't it? How many of you have never failed? <laughs> how many of you wish you'd never failed? <laughs> how many of you know when you fail, you learn more from your failure normally than you do your success. So actually, failure is a good thing in our life, right? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I, you're probably thinking, I thought, I guess Father's Day, and I thought you were going to speak about father, fathering or fathers or the wonder of fathers. You know, I'm, I'm just not, I, I wouldn't make a good Anglican because <laughs> I'm just not very good at that, you know, doing it in the right season kind of thing. I remember once I did a series about Christmas and the birth of Jesus in the summer. I remember when I announced it at our church, I was going to do a series of four uh, teachings on, Chris, uh, on the birth of Jesus to our church. I think, it was in, I think it was in June, so you know, you're lucky you didn't get Christmas today. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember the church looking at me going, but Ian, it's the summer. I, I actually preached about Easter at Christmas once. So I do apologize if you were expecting something about fathers today. But, but let me tell you a story, just to, because I just think fathering is so important. And knowing God as our father is so important. And how he loves to show his life in us and to us, right? And part of this whole thing about failure is all about the good, good father. He's always good. Even when we fail, he's always good. 
I had this experience uh, a couple of years ago. I went for a retreat. Uh, one of the churches in town, City Life Church, had uh, organized a retreat for those that were involved in social activism. Um, and they'd invited me along, uh, and we went to this place out in the beautiful Bedfordshire country, countryside. It actually was this time of year, and it was sunny. <laughs> That's always a good thing, right? And it was this really weird kind of place. I just want to, you know, you know big orbs the, swinging in the trees that you climbed into. And it was, it, you know, it had a crystal room. That was a little bit, that was a little bit interesting. Um, <laughs> but they also, they'd arranged it as well for there to be like um, three meditation, led meditations through the day. And you could do whichever one you wanted. One was a meditation in, in, for the past, a meditation for the present, and then the final one was a meditation for your future. And uh, <clears throat> I decided I'd only go to the last one. I, to be honest, I, I slept most of the day. Did you know retreats really are about sleeping? You know, when your vicar comes and he says, I'm going on a spiritual retreat. I want to tell you, a lot of the time he will sleep. Because actually, in order to find a spiritual refreshing, we do need sometimes a physical refreshing as well. Okay? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I went to this, 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 um, this meditation. It was really good. It was only about 10 minutes long. Um, and the lady was leading it, as she was leading it, I just felt God speak to me really clearly and said, Ian, I have given you a place at the table. And I thought, great, isn't that wonderful? And I, I kind of was smiling to myself, and then the meditation finished, and I went outside. And I'm sitting on this beautifully carved um, seat that is, is shaped like a snail. Be absolutely wonderfully carved. And as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, that's great, but what does that mean? What, <laughs> what does it mean to have a place at the table? It's like, it's just being a little bit weird, you know. Um, anyway, as I'm sitting there, I look, I look over, and they're in front of me, and this is physical. It's not, you know, some people think when I tell this story, it then becomes like a spiritual kind of thing. No, no it was a physical. It was this huge table with these huge thrones around the table, like a, like a big Viking kind of scene, you know, or medieval kind of scene. So I'm, as I'm looking at it, again, I just felt God prompt me and say, I, and I've just, I just want to say, it's not like I'm hearing an audible voice. These are like promptings with inside of me. And I've just learned over the years, it's better to obey those things. Sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. You know, let's not be afraid of making a mistake. In that area. Anyway, so I just felt God say to me, I want you to go and sit in the, in the left-hand throne at the table. Right on the corner, in that left-hand corner. So when I sat there, and I'm thinking, okay, well, what does this mean? And then I looked down, and carved into the table was my name, Ian. I thought, Wow. That's impressive. And then I walked around the table, and there wasn't one other bit of graffiti. There wasn't anything written, nothing else carved. Just in that one left-hand corner, my name. Physical. It'd been there for some time because it had a little bit of mold in it, you know, green stuff in it. I, I was broken. There was something God did deeply in my spirit that day about, I know you. I know you by name. And it's important to me. And it's important to know that in this next, and this is kind of, you know, this is what's come out of that experience. Because, you know, I still really, to be honest, I still walked away went, and crying and I think, still thinking, what does it mean? <laughs> you know, um, but... I, I, and it, it means a number of different things that I've sought God since. But one of the things I came away from was this. Is that in this next season to, of life, you need to know, because we're kind of entering a whole new season of life right now. You need to know that you have a place at the table I've set for you. Whether that's in ministry, whether that's in worship, whether that, 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 that's in, you have a place at that table. I just want to say to you all this morning, that's true of us all. We all have a place at God's table. 
And God is good, even when it seems he's not. God is good to us. He is a good, good father. You know, during Peter's life, <clears throat> you know, it could be described as the good, the bad, and the ugly, couldn't it? Don't you think? I mean, Peter, if you want to if you want to know how to how to handle failure and how to go from being really good to being really bad in a moment, just look at the life of Peter. I love Peter. I identify with Peter. See, <laughs> he's full of faith, but impetuous and doubts. He's strong-willed, always willing to jump in, but often unwisely. Often starts great, but ends in a car crash. Needs, uh, never afraid to offer an opinion or to offend people. If you read, it's really interesting. I, I, sometimes I, I listen, I, I, I'm reading what Peter's saying, and I'm, I'm trying to imagine what the other disciples are thinking at that time. That's what I mean by he's not, he's not afraid to give an opinion to offend people. I mean, some of the things he says in the front of all the other disciples are quite shocking, aren't they? <clears throat> you know, he gets out of the boat. He's walking on the water, and then he sinks. <laughs> he sees Jesus with Elijah and Moses on the, on, on, the, on, the, on the mount, and he wants to build shelter so they can all stay there and keep it for themselves. You are the Lord, the Messiah, he answers to the question of who am, when Jesus asks, who am I? And then the next minute, Jesus is saying to him, get me behind me, Satan. Because <laughs> he's going, no, no, you can't die. Then Peter predicts, uh, sorry, Jesus predicts his death and Peter boasts. <laughs> this is where I wonder what the other disciples were talking about, were wondering at that time. He says, you know, they all might deny you, but I will never deny you. <laughs> no, you know, that's not the subtle bit, is it? You know, I just, want to, I just want to say, if you feel that you've made that kind of faux pas in front of your friends a few times, just think you're in good company. Okay? <clears throat> and then Jesus predicts that he will deny him three times, right? And you'd think at that point, Peter would go, hmm, okay, I'll calm it down a bit, pull it back a bit, right? No, 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 not at all. He just does the same thing. He goes, no, 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 that's not going to happen. They might, but I never will. <clears throat> well, we know the story. You know, he denies him once, twice, three times a denier. No. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> and then he realizes that what Jesus has described has come true. It's happened. At that point, it says, <clears throat> he left the courtyard and he wept bitterly. He didn't just have remorse. He didn't just feel convicted. He was devastated. And it's interesting. I, this is just a kind of little side note. But it's interesting if you read <clears throat> uh, the following bits of Peter's life that are in there. You, I would say he went into quite a depression at that point. You can see a lot of the hallmarks of someone who's depressed at that point. <clears throat> but the good, good father, the wonderful son, the comfort of the Holy Spirit knows at this point, Jesus, Jesus knows how Peter is. 
And it's really interesting. You know, the first time that Jesus appears to, the, to Mary at the tomb, and he says this. This is really interesting. He says, go and tell my disciples what you have seen. But he also says, but actually what he says, he didn't just say that. He says, go and tell my disciples and Peter. Now, actually, you could think, well, he's having a go at Peter there. No, no, I don't think he is. You see, I think he knows that Peter's going to be devastated. <laughs> and he knows he needs to reach right at the beginning into Peter's heart and say, you're still qualified to be with these guys. Because I think the danger would have been, if he hadn't have said that, I think the danger would have been that Peter might have disqualified himself and run away. Can you imagine what it must have been? Jesus is alive. I've got to face him. I've denied him three times. <clears throat> so let's look at how Peter, which is from the scripture we read this morning, how Peter is restored, how Jesus restores Peter. It starts with something familiar right from the beginning. It starts with a similar miracle. So when he, you know, you, we know the story, Pete, Peter, uh, when, when Peter gets called, he's been fishing all night. Jesus tells him to go out again and cast the, at midday, and cast the nets. You know, you know that story? And then what happens from that <clears throat> is they have this incredible catch of fish. So if you read the bit before what we read this morning, that's a, that happens again. It's a similar, a similar miracle. There's something that Jesus is drawing these guys back to. Not just Peter, but these guys back to. And then he, and he cooks breakfast for them. <clears throat> and then Jesus pulls him aside. Now, I think we, we can surmise that he's pulled him aside from verse 20 where he says... As they, uh, they looked behind and the other, the, what the, the disciple Jesus loved is, is following. So I think that at this point, Jesus hasn't done it in front of everybody. He's pulled him aside. They're walking down the beach now. Okay? Let's just imagine this. Paint the scene. They just had breakfast. It's a beautiful day. I know that's hard to, to imagine right now. There's, there's the sun. That's that, orange, that, that yellow orange thing that's in the sky sometimes. You know, it's blue sky. The, the water's... It's really important to use our imagination, right? So the, the, the sun's twinkling off the water, and Jesus says, Peter, let's go for a walk. And it, I can imagine, at this point, this is the thing Peter's been dreading the most, probably. And they start to walk down the beach. And Jesus turns to Peter, and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. So they walk a little bit further. There's a bit of silence. Uh, it's probably a little bit awkward. They walk a little bit down. And Jesus turns to him again. Sorry, he, the, Jesus first time says, do you love me m more than these? Or as much as these? And they walk a bit further down the beach. And Jesus turns to, to Simon. And it, it's interesting, actually. He doesn't call him Peter. He calls him Simon. <laughs> He says, uh, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? Peter pauses. He says, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Take care of my sheep. Jesus turns to him. And they walk a little bit further down the beach. Sorry, I'm going to get into Brendan in a minute. <laughs> and... Uh, and there's a little bit of silence. The silence is still a little bit awkward, probably. And then Jesus turns to Peter again. He says, <clears throat> Simon, son of John, do you love me? That's interesting. The third, Peter, the, th the third time was, it says it was hurt because Jesus had asked him a third time. But his answer was different. His answer was this, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. 
And then he goes on to explain something of how he's going to die. And it's not very good, is it? <laughs> and Peter still hasn't quite learned because you, if you read on in that passage, he says, and, and what about the one who's following? Well, how is he going to die? You know, so, <laughs> so he's still kind of working on that thing. But what's interesting, Jesus brings him full circle. So they started with this miracle from the beginning. And it starts with the same call from the beginning. He says, follow me. The restoration of going for a right full circle. You know, being called, seeing a miracle, being called, walking with Jesus, failing, succeeding, failing, succeeding, denying, to being restored, a pointer to the future. This is what you're called to. Feed the lambs. Care for the sheep, feed the sheep, and follow me wherever I call you to go. So he brings him right full circle again to that whole aspect. There's a pro- progression. Do you truly love me more than these? Do you truly love me? Do you love me? There's a progression in Jesus' question. There's a progression in Peter's answers. The first two are exactly the same. The third, he's hurt, but he realizes that there's only one way that he is ever going to be healed at that point, and that's to hear that Jesus really loves him. To say, you know all things. In other words, there's a sifting that's going on in Peter's life at that time. Jesus is in deepening and unpeeling the independence and the sense of superiority that Peter had demonstrated through three years of walking with Jesus. And then he starts to deal with the regret and the shame that Peter has encountered with these three denials. He asks three questions to restore three denials. So, what can we learn? <laughs> well, first, I, I, it's really important that, that, that we understand that God loves us. No matter how many times you fail, God still loves you. No matter how many times you disappoint Him, He still loves you. No matter what failure has been in your life this morning, God still loves you. No matter what you've done, God still loves you. There's still a time of restoration for you. That's a community thing as well, right? That's not just an individual thing. That, that, the community, this community of Bushmead, God loves so much. No matter how much you think you've blown it. Remember, I had that word last time for you. Don't look to the past. Don't let it define you. Remember that? You, you're moving into a whole new area. Don't keep looking back. Allow God to speak to you, even this morning, allow God to speak to you deeply of his love and his goodness, of his mercy and his grace, unmerited, unlimited. Let me say that again. Unmerited. You cannot earn it. If you think you can earn it by being better, doing better, I'm telling you now, you will fail. Because Peter looked like that. That was Peter's problem. He thought he could stand, that he could be with Jesus through all those things, that he, even that he could stop the very destiny that would bring salvation to the earth. Right? They could do it together, him and Jesus. <laughs> it ended in disaster. And then he comes to that point where he says, Lord, you know all things. That's the point Jesus is bringing him to. So you need courage. First thing in the handling failure is you need courage. Firstly, you need courage to be in the place to fail. (laughs) You know, we are, are, you know, I've kind of had a go at Peter today, right? But he, he did get out of the boat. None of their disciples got out of the boat. I mean, I think some of the other, you know, again, this is like 
speculation, but I think some of the other disciples might have, might have been glad when he sank a little bit because they thought, he's going to be difficult to live with. <laughs> right? You know, they probably had to repent of that at some point. <laughs> but he did get out of the boat, didn't he? He is the one who, who, who said things. He did things. He was always the first there. So you've got to have the courage to fail. Like I said, if you, if you haven't got the courage to fail, you haven't got the courage to succeed. <laughs> we talk a lot in the Christian life about balance. And yeah, can I just say, <laughs> we don't really push and extend the kingdom of God by staying in the middle. Do we hear that? If we, want to say, we have to take risks. If we don't take risks, we don't get on the edge. You know, people say, oh, he's a bit edgy. Good. Because <laughs> if we're not on the edge, we can't extend anything. We're not going to extend anything from the middle. It's a bit dangerous, Ian. Yeah, don't tell Tim I told you that, okay? So. <laughs> you need courage to step out. And then you need courage to face failure. When you fail, face it. Face it head on. It's really interesting, actually. This has kind of inspired me to write a blog. So I'm in the middle of writing a blog at the moment called The Gift of Failure. (laughs) Failure is a gift if we embrace the pain of it. (laughs) But it is painful. Yeah, you know, failure is not easy, is it? Anybody who tells me, yeah, I failed, oh, it's easy. I don't believe them. Failure is not easy, but we have to embrace the pain of it. We have to face it head on. We have to face the consequences of our failure. So the courage to step out and actually fail in the first place, and then to learn the courage to learn from our failure, to embrace it, to face it. Secondly, so that's kind of A and B of courage. Okay. Um, <clears throat> secondly, your need, you need humility. You need humility. When you fail, you need to accept you failed. Not excuse it. Okay? Not, not go, yeah, 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 but you don't understand my... Cir-. You know, all, all, and, and don't misunderstand me. Sometimes when we fail, there are all kinds of circumstances that help that happen. But we still need to own what we fail. We need to have the humility to own when we fail. Just to say, I'm really sorry... I, I, I messed up. Both to God and to each other. Thirdly, you need to have wisdom to put the learning into practice. Okay, so can I just say, this country, we love knowledge. Don't we? And when we have a little bit of knowledge, we think we know. There's a great Chinese proverb. <laughs> you only know when you do. So I think there's a lot of knowing in the sense of we understand, or perhaps a better way of putting it, there's a lot of understanding, but not a lot of knowing in the sense of doing it. So we need to have the wisdom of how to apply that knowledge into practice so we have to take time to process what we've learned well what have we learned then we need to reflect now some of us are really good at reflecting that's natural to us others of us are not if you're not a reflector can I encourage you to reflect more and you know one of the easiest ways to reflect if you're not a reflector is actually to go and ask somebody to help you to do that And then we need to adjust. If you're a reflector, naturally, I want to say, ask somebody to help you how to adjust. Because we're really good at reflection. Oh, yeah, I can see how that works now. Oh, I can see how that does. Oh, yeah, I can see what that means. Mm. But then we don't do it. I'm really good at reflecting. So my wife will tell you often she has to help me how to adjust. So I might have learned the lesson. I might have understood it really well, but I need to adjust my way of living. Fourthly, 
we, ne- we need courage to go again. I was going to put this at the beginning with the, uh, the courage, but I decided to do it. Because it, you have to do the other things before you can go again. But we have to have that courage to go again. I don't, I don't mean fail again in the same way. <laughs> but, <laughs> but often when we have failed, and particularly if it's a big failure, then actually, you know, we are reticent then to take another risk. Don't. Always be a risk taker. And finally, to accept and receive God's unlimited, reckless love and mercy for you. I was talking to somebody that there's a great new song going around about reckless love. And I was talking to somebody the other day, I said, I don't like that. God's not ever reckless. I said, well, I think his love was a bit reckless, wasn't it? You know, he comes down from heaven to live amongst us as a baby. It's a bit reckless, isn't it? We are in the care of humanity. God put himself in the care of humanity. Fully human. He dies on a cross as reckless love, man. <laughs> he could have done it. Uh, it seems like he could have wiped us all out and started again. But he chose not to do that. He chose to be reckless in the way in which he pursued us with his grace and his mercy. It's unlimited, unmerited love. So if you're feeling like a failure this morning, I want to pour out the reckless unlimited, unmerited love of God upon you. And this week when you fail, big or small, remember, first place to go is God's unlimited, un- uh, reckless, undivided attention for you. Final thing, <laughs> and it's not going to take long. The final thing is this. Is often, the bigger the failure, the deeper the transformation. If you look at Peter's life, from that point on, through the Acts of the Apostles, he's like a different guy. He still pursues God with passion, but he's like a different guy. God has done something deep in his heart and spirit. I just pray, Father, we want to thank you for the unlimited love. That you have. We thank you for your incredible grace and mercy. We thank you that failure can be turned into victory. We thank you that our failure can deepen our life with you and our walk with others. And Lord, this morning, we just ask you now that you would pour out your love and grace upon us. Where there are dear things deep in our heart that we fail, we failed at and that we're ashamed of. Lord, I pray you'd bring those things to the surface. We'd be able to face them head on and receive your forgiveness and mercy. Lord, we thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen.